I certainly hate to interrupt everyone uh, jamming to the fine music today, um, but I think we can get started. Um, on behalf of our um, uh, center director, Dr. Lisa Cooper, and our associate director for education and training, Dr. Tangela Purnell, I want to welcome you all to our um, April edition of uh, our Health Equity Jam session here at the um, Center for Health Equity um, at Johns Hopkins. And I could not be more thrilled about uh, the speaker that we have uh, joining us today from New York. We wish that he could be here with us in person, but um, we're really excited uh, to welcome Dr. Samuel Kelton Roberts, who is um, the former director of uh, Columbia University's Institute for Research in African American Studies and um, is currently um, an associate professor at Columbia. Um, he's an associate professor of history in the School of Arts and Sciences there and also um, has an appointment as Associate Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at the um, School of Public Health um, at Columbia, um, as well as um, in the um, School of Arts and Sciences in um, African American Studies. Um, he leads the research cluster in race, inequality, and health. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Sure. Roberts um, has been uh, um, received lots of... Uh, Let me start. Sorry, I'm gonna ask, to mute whomever that is there. Okay, great. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Roberts' uh, book has been widely acclaimed. It's called um, Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health Effects of Segregation, um, which was published back in 2009 and is an exploration of the political economy of race and the modern uh, American public health state um, between the late 19th century and the mid 20th century. And um, certainly this period encompasses the overlapping and mutually informed eras of Jim Crow segregation and also the birth of modern public health practices. Um, and so um, he's currently uh, researching and writing a, a book um, that is examining the social and political history of heroin addiction uh, treatment from the 1950s to the 1990s. Um, in addition to um, this work, Dr. Roberts writes, teaches, and lectures widely on African-American urban history especially medicine, public health, and science, and technology. And as I mentioned, this is a special treat for me to introduce Dr. Roberts. Um, he's probably, of all the speakers that I've gotten to introduce in my career, probably the one that has known me the longest. Um, we've known each other for several decades. I won't tell you how many, but we were um, college classmates at the University of Virginia, go Hoos. Um, and uh, I could not be, be prouder of, of the work that he's done and, and, and could not be more excited to um, have him share with uh, colleagues here at the Center for Health Equity. So I will turn it over to Dr. Roberts. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you to uh, the center. Thank you to all of my hosts here. It's uh, I've been looking forward to this engagement for a while. And uh, I have to say, I think this is the only talk that I've given this past year, certainly where I had my own intro music to step into. So thank you so much for that. I think I'm going to put that in my contract moving forward for every invited lecture that I do. Thank you so much for that. And uh, again, yeah, Deidre, it's good to be reunited. By the way, some of my old college roommates say hello, um, folks that you'll all remember. So I just texted them and told them that we were hanging out together today. It's it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Dr. Cruz uh, mentioned, I've been spending quite a bit of time over the last several years thinking about um, the history of addiction treatment. And that seems kind of almost a straightforward proposition until I mentioned to you that uh, really, we've never really known what this thing that, you know, we used to call addiction today, we call it substance use disorder. Before that, it was called inebriety, um, you know, dipsomania in terms of like alcohol. We've given it lots of names. The, the paradigm shifts come about every 10, 15 or 20 years or so, shorter than a generation, um, I would say in a lot of ways. Um, 
And so we've never really known exactly what this thing is. Um, there's medical versions, there's cognitive behavioral, you know, approaches, there's, you know, the whole, the whole range of things here. So that said, if we don't really know what addiction is, it's the real question is, what is, you know, what we used to call rehabilitation, what we more likely call recovery, right? Um, so that's where, that's kind of the main question of the book. The idea that if addiction has been so much, um, and by the way, when I say addiction, um, always think of that as scare quotes, because I'm a historian, which means everything, well, not everything, but many things for me are historically constructed. I'm thinking about a historical concept, um, that this, uh, is, this, this concept has always been racially inflected. We've never really had much of a moral panic around the drug in this country, unless it was somehow racialized, unless it was attached to a uh, racialized other. You know, ch uh, anti-Chinese sentiment gave us anti-opium laws. Um, the first cocaine laws in the early 20th century were largely, you know, came largely out of um, the assumption that it was really, you know, African Americans, you know, but one generation or so out of freedom in the South who were, you know, drug crazed cocaine fiends run amok, et cetera, et cetera. Crack cocaine, heroin, it goes marijuana with Mexicans, it goes on and on and on. So then the question is, um, what is recovery? That's not the question I want to answer today, but it's, it's kind of an overlaying question of the book. Today, I want to give you some thoughts that kind of form an, uh, uh, an epilogue to the book, which is to say, I want to talk, I want to speak to you today or with you today, because I certainly hope this will become a dialogue about what is, um, what, what are we talking about when we say harm reduction? All right. Um, that's kind of the, think of that as the kind of overlaying question for my comments today. Before I go much further, I'm going to share my screen and beg patience and pardon from each of you as I do this. And with any luck, it will go ever so smoothly. And Dr. Cruz, I may ask you just to shout and confirm that you all are seeing my title slide. Yeah, we can see it. Let's okay, see. fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Um, all right. So just thinking a bit about um, the current moment, right? Meaning the last, you know, several years, not this very moment on, on April 28th. Uh, we've certainly had a lot before, before COVID, I think really the main discussion, you know, in public health anyway, was, um, you know, the opioid overdose crisis, right? And I think everyone in the audience, many people outside of medicine and public health by now have been exposed to the critique that, you know, it seems like we only really cared about this when the profile or what we believe the profile to be of the average quote unquote victim was white. Right. Um, in fact, statistics actually belie that over the past five years or so, we've certainly seen an uptick in overdose deaths, opioid overdose deaths among black and brown people, black and Latinx people uh, in particular. But that that notwithstanding, certainly the profile, the perceived profile was someone who was white. Right. And so there's a certain kind of um, I think many of us who, uh, you know, work in health equity, or historians who make commentary on the contemporary moment, even while we keep a you know an eye on the on the past, have noted the kind of tragic you know paradox and irony of this. All right, this is um, and you know and for good reasons you know reasons which I think are laudable and certainly which I would support. Um, our civic leaders, particularly in this new administration, have embraced this thing we call harm reduction. Right. I don't need to tell, I think, our audience today what harm reduction is, um, even though I, even while I make the argument that it needs to have a bit more precision to it. Uh, certainly in the last several years, we've had you know, states that we thought, you know, almost inconceivable 15 years ago to you know, loosen restrictions on needle exchanges, for example, is in, in a national discussion that we're having at this moment. We're giving, you know, perhaps more serious thought to decriminalization than we have since the national criminalization of drug use um, in 1914 with the uh, Harrison Act and the Harrison Anti-Narcotics Act of 1914. So it's been basically a century since we started to uh, really think this through um, in the ways that we're approaching now. Certainly, the war on drugs itself is about 50 years old this this year. Actually, 1971 is when Richard Nixon declared it. Um, but uh, I would say that our larger and our longer history of drug criminalization, stigmatization, um, and marginalization of people who use substances goes back at least to a century or more. All right. Um, and so we're at this new moment. 
I want to pivot a bit to another historical moment, if I might, <clears throat> some 20 plus years ago. Um, and this is, I would like to introduce you to Imani Woods, whose uh, image here is uh, before you. Uh, Amani Woods uh, was an African-American woman. She passed away some, a, a bit before I began this project. So unfortunately, I never actually met her, but I know quite a few people who did know her, um, all of whom remember her. And she was known um, in her lifetime also as a brilliant social worker, organizer, uh, and a leading harm reduction activist specializing particularly in Black communities. Um, she was, in fact, one of the original cadre of harm reduction activists who were based here in New York City. I'll speak a bit about them as well. She began uh, her work at the famous Narcotic and Drug Research Institute, NDRI, in the mid-1980s. Mid she then went to work for a pioneering and, and, to st and today historically recognized uh, harm reduction organization called the Association for Drug Abuse Prevention and Treatment, also known as ADAPT. Um, and then she went to form, like I said, with this other with uh, with these other fellow-minded or you know similarly-minded fellow travelers, um, uh, the uh, the first harm reduction cadres here in New York City. Then she went out to Seattle to uh, become the executive director of the Street Outreach Services, also known as SOS. Um, now, there were two issues that Amani Woods, as she recalled them in an article that she published in the late 1990s, um, that, fa that she faced and that uh, other harm reductionists of color also faced. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit about this because it's really important. I think what we get from, from Amani Woods is a message. I think this is in a lot of ways where you know, history can, in fact, be usable to our present and to our future. And she gives us a message about what we should be thinking about. And I would make the argument that like what she said some, you know, a quarter century ago is as pertinent, perhaps even more so, and certainly as urgent today. Um, so that will be the kind of substance of my comments for the next, you know, 35 minutes or so. Um, all right, so there were two issues that that Woods faced, right? One was, um, and she, she identified, um, both in, in a 1998 article in which she, uh, you know, addressed what it would take to turn, um, to, to create an analytically sophisticated harm reduction movement and make it a viable one socially and politically in black communities. All right. She's doing all of this work and yet she feels like I'm, I, am I really reaching the audience that I need to reach? Um, and there were two, two obstacles or two challenges to this. One is there's this, this taboo subject, this taboo even really today in a lot of ways. Um, and it's a subject that's plagued or challenged that's plagued multi-ethnic social justice organizations and movements really since the early 19th century, since before, since the anti-slavery campaigns. Um, um, and that's to say the marginalization and alienation of people of color as leaders and as rank and file. All right, this is something um, that we know about, like I said, the anti-slavery movement, where there were, in fact, you know, some pretty deep debates between black abolitionists and white ones. Uh, we certainly saw this in the civil rights movement. We saw this in labor organizing in the 1930s. Certainly, we see a lot of this happening today in a, in a wide range of movements. It's a kind of almost perennial, and I don't want to make it sound like it's intransigently persistent, but it's something that's there um, that still asserts and reasserts itself historically, generation after generation. All right, and so she identifies it in the 1990s, um, in which you know, working in this harm, this this nascent newly born harm reduction movement, she's identifying some of these challenges. And she says, you know, the, the efforts of well-meaning harm reductionists of European descent, this is a quote, to design programs for and introduce them into African-American communities will be regarded with suspicion and distrust by the members of those communities. Moreover, I've found that despite, or in some cases, as the result of their good intentions, white harm reductionists tend to reenact patterns of uh, white dominance and black submission in their attempts to work with their black counterparts. All right, so she's she's there's this kind of tension going on within the harm reduction movement about you know white harm reductionists and a kind of paternalism that they often evince or exhibit towards their black colleagues in the movement and towards the people whom putatively they are supposed to be serving, and then 
Woods does something really interesting in this, this article in 1998. There's another one from 1995 or so where she says, where she starts to actually evoke the theorizations of W.E.B. Du Bois um, and notes that black harm reduction is quote, experience our two-ness as our white counterparts expectations um, become overbearing. This two-ness is a, is a reference back to Du Bois and his theory of double consciousness. Now, Amani Woods, I just wanna say, is a, is, is a you know, notably eclectic and synthetic intellectual. Um, you know, what, what like a theorist like Antonio Gramsci might say an organ organic intellectual. As far as I know, she never, you know, was an academically based, you know, uh, it's unfortunate today we kind of associate intellectuals with the academy, right? And I would argue against, I would say, certainly in this movement um, today and back then, some of the most intellectually astute people you'll ever want to talk to um, are found in, you know, harm reduction, particularly in harm reduction of color circles. And so she's actually, she's read widely and you, you know, you'll find her quoting, you know, Malcolm X or France Fanon and W.B. Du Bois and others as she talks about some of these challenges. Here she's, uh, this is another quote where she's actually identifying black harm reductions as quote, a, um, a rare but powerful commodity. All right, and that, that use of the word commodity is interesting as well, because we're at a point in the 1990s where there actually is funding money to be had out here. So I don't know if that, how intentional that was when she wrote that, but there you have it. Um, now there was a second challenge as well, right? The first is like, how do you deal with white colleagues in this movement, in a movement that Amani Woods would argue should be really about racial justice as much as anything else. Harm reduction, it, you know, per se may not be enough to address the structural violence of the war on drugs, of criminalization, of racism, all these things that today we kind of bundle in under the phrase of intersectionality, right? Or intersectional analysis. Second, uh, second challenge was, uh, was um, the ironic difficulty in overcoming black popular resistance to harm reduction principles and in getting ordinary black people to understand the nature and potential benefits of harm reduction practiced for and by black people. Um, and here we have another quote. She says, you know, people look at me like I'm crazy when I go to the black community and explain harm reduction. I'm accused of supporting a policy that makes peace with genocide. Genocide is a word, by the way, um, just parenthetically, that shows up in a lot of critique of harm reduction, a lot of critiques of methadone maintenance since the 1960s and 70s. Um, so much so that I argue in the book that this really isn't, we're not looking at hyperbolic language here, that I think it's actually a level of analysis that we, to which we haven't been attending in public health, even while we disagree with it, it's something to which we should give some attention. So she says, you know, they, they say I'm making peace with genocide. How can I talk about quote unquote, reducing harm to a community under siege? This, the scourge must be lifted. The villain must be vanquished. Harm reduction is seen as settling, giving up, accepting failure and bargaining with the devil, end quote. Um, and, you know, she goes on to talk about how people say, you know, like this, you know, you, they've been locking this up for years under the war on drugs. And now you want to give us needles so we can kill ourselves or be locked in jail. What's that about? Um, you know, why aren't you doing more about, you know, anti -po you know, poverty or, you know, lack of opportunity? Um, you know, one woman says, you know, I'm, I'm raising my grandchildren right now because my son and his partner are both in jail for for drugs, and I, you're you're telling me that somehow giving needles away is like that's the option, that's the solution. So there's a there's a kind of pol a kind of um, a colloquial or vernacular political logic to this critique, right? And Amani Woods takes it seriously, right? Because she is from these communities, right? She understands it even when she doesn't agree with it. Um, and I think this is a really important stance for all of us to think about. And certainly it was for her. She ended up spending the rest of her career, which unfortunately was cut short. Um, I don't think she was 60, maybe 65 when she passed away. She might have been younger than that. I, I actually am not quite sure. But in any case, um, this is something that she that her career is marked by grappling with this question. Um, part of the, the overarching challenge she also identified for this, um, and I would say that it's a challenge that still faces us today. She says, I'm sorry, my, let me make sure my slide is. Oops, there we go. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Um, one thing that she says, we need a workable and shared definition of harm reduction. All right, 
So many different definitions and ideas presently exist in the harm reduction movement that this lack of consistency is a problem in itself. African Americans will scrutinize and examine harm reduction efforts, searching for uniformity. In the black community, we've all got to be on the same page when we consider what's at stake, end quote. And so she's saying, you know, like we don't really have an agreed upon definition. This is, by the way, about, you know, close to about 15 years into the movement. It's still a new movement, but 15 years is, you know, that's, it's, it's kind of got its sea legs at this point. And she's noting this inconsistency, that she's having difficulty going to talking to people on the street and say, hey, you know, I work in harm reduction. And then people say, well, what's that? And she's still always fumbling, like she's giving her own definitions, but she knows that these aren't the ones that many of her white colleagues would have. Um, and so she's, you know, she, at this, after doing that for a number of years, she says, yeah, you know what, I think we need a real definition. She actually doesn't offer one in any of her um, writings or any recordings um, that I've heard of her. And it's unfortunate. However, um, we can glean something from some of the material that she did leave. And I wanna say that, she, that these challenges in some present to us this, this overarching one, right? Which is how do we think about what is harm reduction today? <clears throat> This question today is, is pretty much the same one that she was facing some years ago. The question before us today is what is harm reduction and what does it have to say and do at this moment when the movement for black lives and a popularly named white opioid overdose crisis has reminded us not only of the violence of the war on drugs, but the structural violence of which the war on drugs is but one part. All right, no, knowing I be, believing or knowing what I believe to know about my audience here today, I don't think I really need to go in depth to speak with you or to you know, elucidate or pull apart <clears throat> the structural violence and inequities in um, that first act as fundamental determinants of health, um, structural and social, but also within the health, within uh, networks or health, you know, um, biosocial networks of health preservation, health maintenance, and to say nothing of our healthcare system itself, all right? And so I'm, I'm arguing here, this is, kind of the, the challenge that I think we're facing today is how do we think about harm reduction in a way that matches the, the moment right now? How will harm reduction become, you know, avoid the danger of becoming irrelevant right now when it's really being most widely accepted, uh, more widely accepted than it has been in the past, you know, 30, 40 years or so, all right? It, there is a danger here. Um, like I said, Amani Woods did not give us much of a uh, definition per se, but I would like to, if, if I could be indulged for a few minutes, to give you a clip of a, um, a video that uh, SOS produced. It's, it's not the entire video, just a few minutes of it. And, I, and I'm, I'm gonna make an argument afterwards that what we see here is really a type of praxis of, of the theory, all right? That she's, that she's in, in describing SOS and her work in Seattle, she's really laying out what, defining what she believes harm reduction should be and I, I think that this definition um that the work that we that we're going to see from some this video is from 1991 so 30 years ago um is you know this is the early phases of a, of a movement that we see more robustly today when you look at particularly harm reduction of color organizations um throughout the country but amani woods is certainly one of the pioneers so uh dr cruz again i'm going to ask you to act as my um my audio visual technician and just tell just maybe just yell out if you all can hear the the audio with this please and you might walk all night yeah we can you hear might sleep somewhere great thank you you might uh just might not have any place to go where you feel safe some nights you might be out here just smoking dope or running the streets all night and any way you go about it is never fun because you just you don't have a place to even just actually just lay down your head and relax just think for a minute about how it is to be homeless. I mean, I can't imagine it right now, okay? I can't imagine having no place to go. And if you ain't got no place to go, you're likely to do anything. And one of the situations that I found when I moved to Seattle four years ago is that people refuse to look at Seattle as a major urban area. I think now people are, okay? But four years ago, it was like, oh, we don't need that. And some departments here aren't that bad. And what Street Outreach Services provided was it, it, it was the testing ground so that people here could actually see how bad the problems are. And we have 
hundreds on some days when it gets cold. We can, we can see more, up to 200 people a day. Folks are in and out of that place, coming in to get services, coming in to get a cup of coffee, get some information, feel some social support, you know. Just feel the unconditional love that they get when they come through the doors of Street Outreach Services. You know, what, what their needs are, and then looking in our community to find out what it is in our community that can take care of those needs. If it's, if it's education, if it's an ID card to get a job, or a social security card, where can they go to get the money? All the people downtown know SOS outreach workers. Buenas, ¿cómo están? Okay, nos vemos. Mi nombre es Isabel. Antonio. Okay. It is important that they see me every day because that assures them that I'm here and that I care. And they know that SOS is not there only for once in a while or when they have, they, we are there for them. You want a body lotion? They learn because I talk to them about cleaning, about hygiene and all that, right in the street, whatever, you know. And uh, we don't go and say, hey, you got papers to help you because that's why we started this. We are not asking for documentation or nothing. We are just going there and asking if they need help. I'm here. The Hispanic community in Seattle is catching hell. It's rough because so many of them are undocumented. So they have their concerns about immigration and the police are particularly hard on them. And it's very difficult to solve the problems of the Hispanic population here because we find that they are ineligible for many services that other individuals, you know, are eligible for. We know that this is a big problem, so what we do is we call in other agencies to help us. And we have agencies, you know, we have Hispanic providers from many agencies that come in and work with the Hispanic population. And um, we, are, we have a fundraiser coming up for the Hispanic population that we work with. And we're just trying to put bilingual, you know, get bilingual volunteers in place and work with other agencies that are culturally appropriate for that group of people so that we are able to help them in some ways solve their problem because the issues are deep, very, very deep. Our uh, infant mortality component is something that I am especially proud of and especially happy I'm fine. about. One of the things that we were able to do was acquire the two best infant mortality outreach workers in the whole city. Over 50% of infant mortality's community of color can be attributed to substance abuse. Over 50% of the low birth weights, neglect, and so forth attributed to substance abuse. So there again, we're back knocking at that door messing with the social issues, messing with the political issues, and we keep coming back and back and back again. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't understand that if we don't solve, if we don't get to the root of the tree, the tree's just going to keep growing. You can chop it as much, many ways as you want. And that's what we do in infant mortality. We go right out there in the street and talk to the sisters. We say, hey, what's going on? Yeah. At Street Outreach Services, we work on the basic needs approach. That's why we have the clothing bank. That's why we have the food available. That's why we have all these different components to our program. The result of a divorce, door, and I ended up getting the short end of the street. I was uh, no contact ordered. I had nowhere to go. See, that if you don't feel good about yourself, if you have no self-esteem, if you don't know who you are, why on earth would you protect yourself? We are down there with the net to catch them folks that's totally on their way down the drain, period. We know that, and that's what, we, that's what we're aiming for. I love people. I love human beings. And this is what I always wanted to do. And anyway, someone had to do it. So I'm doing it, and I'm happy with it. And I bless SOS every day because we help them. We're down there with them folks that nobody wants to deal with, okay? And well, we have to spend a lot of time even getting them ready to access agencies and to go to treatment because it's, most of them have lost their social skills for the most part, don't even know how to speak to people anymore. And I love being here, you know. I, I've made so many friends here. All these people, they depend on me. They, they depend upon my coming here and sitting here. Sometimes I don't see them. And sometimes they're here all day. Sometimes I can't get rid of them, but that's okay because uh, we've uh, built a bond together. 
you got to give something back in order to know what you got, I feel. So on a daily basis, I have to come out here and touch base with where I came from. So I won't get the arrogance that I see a lot of people have when they, when they get to a point. It's more like a friendship thing because they see, they've, they've seen me progress from really low to a much higher type person. You know, I'm sorry that I did what I did, but I learned so much as a result of being on the street, being homeless, being hooked on drugs, even though it was a school of hard knocks. I got my degree and now I'm going for another one. I'm really, really proud of you, what you're doing. Don't forget, man, I'm here for you anytime. I don't have any social support or family support. They don't have anyone to guide them. And we give that guidance. All right. Thank you uh, for indulging me for those few minutes there. Uh, I think there's some... And by the way, everyone can hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm always a little nervous about transitioning between audio platforms. All right. So there's a couple of things I want to, to which I'd like to call your attention on this one. First, um, let's look at how Woods and SOS think about social structure, right? Although SOS is known largely for its needle exchange programs. Um, it's clear that Woods and her colleagues saw their work as tackling not just HIV and AIDS, but also the social structure in which the virus spread. All right, for example, we got a glimpse of their work with individuals whose housing was insecure or non-existent, um, with pregnant women and mothers caught at the intersecting inequalities of race, class, gender, and substance use disorders, um, with the HIV positive population and with undocumented populations unable to access essential social services, right? And then second, there's something else I'd like to, to which I'd like to call your attention. Although in the film, neither Woods nor SOS offer a definition of harm reduction itself, we can infer it from their own statements, right? Harm reduction for them, it seems, was not solely, again, about HIV and AIDS prevention, but instead a broader attack on the social, economic, and political structures, which left people vulnerable to a host of assaults. I'm going to probably, I think I can mute somebody. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, I'm sorry, where was I? Oh, right. So for them, harm reduction is a broader attack on all the social, economic, and political structures, which left people vulnerable to a host of assaults on their own health and the health of their communities as well. This is what she meant when she said, there we go knocking at the door, messing with the social issues, messing with the political issues. I really like that quote because it's, it's just, it really encompasses the broader spectrum or the, the kind of broader framework in which she's um, approaching her work. There's good reasons for Woods and SOS to point to social structure. By the early 1990s, the Black AIDS syndemic was firmly established, if not always recognized. Black gay activists in the 1980s feared for their lives as they attempted to bring awareness not only to Black political and civic leadership, but also to other Black gay men who wrongly believed that AIDS was something you contracted if you, you, know, if you went with a white man. Beginning in the late 1980s, the HIV AIDS epidemic turned syndemic, meaning that HIV transmission met other epidemics already existing in our communities um, and also the social conditions that exacerbated HIV, uh, HIV when HIV arrived. Rates of HIV infection, I, I imagine that many of you in the audience might be familiar with these, if not in the specifics, certainly in the generalities. Um, rates of HIV infection certainly pointed this up. Black Americans who throughout the 20th century really comprised only about 12 or 13% of the population for a, you know over 100 years. Um, it's been a pretty steady proportion. By 1992, we represented 29% of the total reported AIDS cases since 1981, right? So in basically about a decade, this had become, you know, it was on its way to becoming a, you know, let's just call it a black disease, so to speak, which not to say exclusively black, but, you know, out of proportion, you know, disproportionately African-American. Black women in the mid 1990s were particularly vulnerable um, because of the connection between HIV transmission and drug injection. Um, in fact, black women represented slightly more than half of all AIDS cases in women, largely because of intravenous drug use, to which the CDC attributed about 55% of all cases. Another 34% came from heterosex heterosexual transmission, and a large proportion of those, again, were traced to uh, drug use, 
So clearly, um, the HIV and injection drug use connection is large as it is connected syndemically with uh, gender oppression, with homophobia, with uh, the disinvestment in cities, um, the, the, the war on welfare, which was completed in, by, in the 1990s with Bill Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here I have just you know a couple of this is like a you know frequently seen chart showing the flip between white and black um, uh, infection. Here on the right we have a um, one of I mean this is, you can find all types of graphics illustrating the syndemic. This is not this, the term syndemic was actually came in 1994 from a medical anthropologist by the name of Merrill Singer. Um, very powerful concept. It's still greatly in use um, today. And this is a, a you know, one one of my colleagues or a couple of my colleagues put together this this uh, schema right here to show the syndemic uh, interactions between trauma, poverty, HIV, substance use, and incarceration. By the way, all right. All right. So let me see here. All this to say is that what, as a historian, what I think I've ascertained in the historical record. Meaning what, you know, the words that people like Amani Woods have left us, not just Amani Woods, I'm using her as a kind of, you know, a metonym for the larger movement, but certainly many, many others. Um, what they've left us, I think, I, what I think I've discerned, um, a harm reduction of color perspective, right, which is, is quite different from just generally what we consider to be harm reduction, all right? Um, and so there's, I'll just name a few things about it or give you, this is my definition, all right. A harm reduction of color perspective is one in which the basic tenets and philosophy of harm reduction in the US have been adapted and expanded to be of service in communities of color. In an African-American context, an HROC perspective is one which draws from both the tradition of harm reduction, but also from a longer and more broadly grounded black critical, even radical tradition. This is to say that the astounding work accomplished by harm reductionists since the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s provide but one important informing source of ideas and strategies to the HROC movement. To that is added the even more historically rich Black and Latino critical tradition. From the Reconstruction era after the Civil War to the present moment of the movement for Black lives in which always in all these movements, these two and all those in between, we've seen embedded analyses of the color line social inequality, gender and sex, politics, the law, and economics, all right? This is, um, this is kind of, in a lot of ways, this is kind of an egg-headed way of reiterating what Amani Woods just told us some minutes ago. All right, so that said, for my remaining time, I wanna talk about the four aspects that I believe I've found in, all right, I think I might have to mute somebody again. I think someone else's microphone is, interrupting us. Um, all right, so first, uh, a structural analysis which emphasizes not just individual, but also community health and autonomy. That's very important, particularly in the early years of the harm reduction and in many local harm reduction movements today, unfortunately, we have a, really an overemphasis on individual behavior and not thinking structurally. Um, not as much today as it might have been 20 years ago or so, but it still remains. And this is an issue that you see in um, you know, in the, in the movement at large. Second, historical roots in a much longer history of struggle for freedom within communities of color. I just mentioned that the definition. Third, a certain philosophical eclecticism in pursuit of wide ranging analytical positions. And then for, you know, what I think is really one of the strongest aspects of this is a pariah centered approach, um, considering the functions, structure and political economy of stigma, all right? Um, I'm going to breeze through one through three so I could spend more time on um, on uh, on number four. All right, so I said a bit about number one already, right? How HIV was quickly becoming a black disease, right? Um, by the way, our analysis, our structural analysis of HIV uh, was born from this moment here in the United States, you know, realizing where HIV was really popping up most strongly. It was where you already had these pre-existing social assaults um, or structural assaults in the form of mass incarceration, disinvestment in our communities, disinvestment in education, capital flight. Um, notice I don't use the term white flight, I talk about capital flight. Um, 
I don't think the problem was that white people left. The problem is that all the money left um, and the tax base left. Um, all of those things were there in advance of HIV. Um, and so a structural analysis, like the one that Woods brings to bear, is going to take all that into account. Historical roots in a much longer history of struggle of freedom within communities of color. It is, it is very common today and then to see Black harm reductionists and Latinx harm reductionists frame their work in the history um, as a continuing a continuation of civil rights movements, of um, radical labor movements, even going back to the 1930s, but particularly civil rights and Black and Brown power movements. Here in New York City, the Young Lords Party, um, uh, which was based in the Bronx and East Harlem, uh, is widely credited with um, with uh, it, having participated in the early years of the construction of a radical recovery program. Um, it was actually called the People's Recovery Program or Radical Recovery at Lincoln Hospital. Um, and today, harm reductionists see them as being progenitors of the modern movement. Um, members of the Black Panther Party often are cited as, as intellectual foreparents of these movements as well. This is very much a synthetic um, self-awareness of their role in history. All right. Even you might see, this is a poster from um, graphic artist Glenn Ligon, um, one of my favorite artists from the period who was a member of the collective called Visual Aids. And uh, this is a poster. I always forget for whom this was commissioned. And of course, it's a bit, oh, actually, you all can't see this folder. I'm sorry. Um, all right. Sorry. I've just, I've gone Yeah, sorry. Okay, here's the poster. I'm sorry. I think I lagged behind a couple of my slides here. But in any case, here showing, you know, the fight against AIDS is being in line with civil rights. And here we see, you know, a kind of a visual or a drawn rendering of a famous photograph of, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. HIV is also part of a historical political moment. And here I would just briefly like to shout out some of my colleagues in the field. Kathy Cohen's The Boundary of Blackness, Stephen Inrig's North Carolina and the Problem of AIDS. Um, Kevin Mumford's Not Straight, Not White is an excellent uh, study of Black gay political movements um, before and during HIV. And then more recently, Dan Royals' fantastic book from last year, To Make the Wounded Whole, The African-American Struggle Against HIV AIDS on um, on a UNC press. So uh, I would just take a moment to give some product placement, as if you will, for those. Um, and then, as I said, Phil, and like I said, I'm breathe, breezing through these, but just to, you know, just to tell you some of my thoughts about this, about the philosophical eclecticism that's involved in, um, in black harm reduction as well. And I'm sorry, I think I've, um, and here, in this regard, you'll see not just, you know, people thinking of themselves in line with Du Bois or Malcolm X or King, but also um, very much in line with and quoting from and engaging with the ideas of Black gay activists such as uh, Essex Hemphill, Joseph Beam, um, Audre Lorde, uh, uh, Baldwin, even as well. Um, so, you know, we'd see here a robust philosophical eclecticism in black harm reduction. And then finally, I want to talk about the pariah centered approach. And these will be my concluding comments for the next few minutes. All right. Here, I really, um, I really, I would really urge you all to think about, um, and, I'm, and actually, I shouldn't even say that because I imagine what I, what I think I know about this audience, you probably already are. But if you're not, um, here in the context of the war on drugs, the context of our criminalization of people who use certain substances, our alienation of these people and, and um, you know, kind of all of the ways that we just make it difficult for them to pursue their lives and to pursue their health and wellness really just as importantly. Um, I want to offer a framing of stigmas not being something that's arbitrary or just, you know, quote unquote, culturally based. Uh, I think a lot of times people talk about stigma in the way that, you know, you know, a couple of decades ago, people talked about prejudice, right? You know, like, as you know, it's just, or people are just ignorant and one person doesn't like another person because of the group from which they, you know, hail. Um, 
I argue against that and, and more pertinently for our discussion today against that feeling, that definition of stigma. I want to make an argument that stigma actually has a role in legitimating structural violence. All right. Think of some of our kind of common mythologies, right? Our, you know, our stigma generating mythologies. You know, when we think about lack of access to health care, um, you know, we, we, you know, we body shame people, we health shame people all the time. You know, it's like, oh, you just don't take care of yourself. Um, the fate of families with a retraction of social and economic support. You know, we, I mean, you know, that's the Moynihan report from 1965, you know, who called our families, you know, lazy, disorganized, dysfunctional. Reproductive injustices, right? Um, you know, sex shaming people, um, thinking of them as like, you know, sexually licentious or, you know, deviant. Gun violence. Right, that's a big one, right? We just talk about kind of youth violence without even thinking structurally about what's going on there. Um, lack of protection for, se for sexual minorities. Um, declines in educational opportunity, environmental injustices, it goes on and on and on, right? All of these play a role in our political economy, right? They serve a function. It's not, um, these are structural, I guess is what I'm saying. All right, so a pariah-centered approach is one, um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to actually skip ahead, uh, is one in which, that is one that sees stigma as having that function within structural inequality um, and as a way to rationalize that inequality. Um, so what I call a pariah-centered approach is different from what we used to call, what some of us still call a user-centered approach. I don't, uh, here I want to, not reify this cat this you know ontologically unstable category you know identity category of drug user right um it's not really it's not useful analytically um for a number of reasons however what i think is useful is thinking about if we say if we call something a pariah centered approach it should immediately invoke in us the question why is someone being made into a pariah and once you ask that series of questions, once you unravel that skein of thread, you know, this kind of ball of yarn here, and it kind of, that, 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 that puts you in the first step on your way to a structural analysis and thinking about what a harm reduction of color um, paradigm or framework should offer to us, all right? Um, it should confront stigma more directly and forcefully by initiating, as I said, its inquiry, critiques, and strategies with the object of stigma um, itself, meaning social exclusion, popular opprobrium, and legal sanction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also simultaneously launches an examination of the ways in which those forces inform and shape various worldviews, pariahs, and others. This is important because if we want to go back to what Amani Wood was saying about trying to speak to people in the Black community about harm reduction, and knowing that they don't get it. I mean, they accused her of, of you know, being you know, an agent of genocide, said what she was doing was no different from the Tuskegee experiment. It goes on and on. And if we can't just dismiss that as being kind of you know, uninformed, ignorant, um, you know, just because we don't agree with them. I would argue that if you think of a pariah-centered approach, it also helps us think about historically and contemporaneously some of the political analyses and social analyses that we see on the ground in our communities. And it's because harm reduction so often has failed to meet those needs the way that Imani Woods was trying to do with SOS, that we have people saying, you know, forget these needles. What are you gonna do about all these other issues that we know have a role in HIV? You know, they, you know, people may not be using the language of syndemics, but certainly that's the way they're thinking. And so a pariah-centered approach will help us think through that political logic as well in ways that, you know, quote unquote, user-centered logics or user-centered frameworks may not. So I think, you know, if I may modestly offer that, I would say that's our, um, that might be, you know, something, you know, one of the um, more urgent and forceful uh, um, offerings in our harm reduction of color um, uh, perspective. So some concluding thoughts. I would say, you know, speaking as a historian, you know, which is where my, you know, I get outside my bailiwick once in a while. 
um, certainly when I get to, to speak with audiences such as, as yours today. But as someone who also keeps spends a good amount of time thinking about the historiography, you know, what it is to write this type of history, I would say that we really, we historians and social scientists need to pay much more attention to the political organization of the communities which historically have borne the brunt of drug regulation in this, in this country. We don't really do enough to think about political subjectivity. And I'll, I can discuss more about that in the Q&A if there's questions. Secondly, we need to think very clearly about the political and economic functions of stigma, as I've mentioned before, um, and its essential role in the maintenance of structural racism and violence. All right, that's, I think, doing one, not doing the one will certainly not help you get towards a goal of undoing the other. So we certainly must launch a critique um, and a sustained one and an analytically structural um, and forceful one. Of, of stigma itself, what does it what does it do? And a third and final consideration goes to the previous two. If we have an idea how various institutions, you know, this would be courts, law enforcement, medical authority, you know, definitely political structures have defined addiction, right? And as I said at the top of my comments, addiction's always been racialized. Um, this is how we got the problem with you know white opioid addicts, and all of a sudden. You know, it's for them, you know, they're the ones for whom we have sympathy. I'm speaking colloquially um, and about a society, not necessarily myself here. Um, that's because of the racialization over more than a century of our thoughts about drugs. If that's been the case, what does that mean about recovery? Can you have a popular, you know, widely accepted, useful, and, you know, assertive, you know, politically and policy you know, aspect, you know, in the, in the policy world, assertive version and definition of recovery that doesn't take into account racial stigma and its structural functions. I'm not sure that can happen, right? Um, in the same way that, you know, undoing the problems of the war on drugs will be undone just simply by decriminalizing. Like we need to have a, a real reckoning, a fully loaded cost accounting, in fact, of what has been done to communities of color in the name of the war on drugs. And you know, really like the first order of business must be rebuilding those. And I would say certainly the kind of conceptual rebuilding must be done, a conceptual reconstruction of what it is to be in recovery. It's not just about abstinence. It's not just about, can you get off the drug, so to speak? We really need to think about how all of us as individuals, you know, work and move in this world and what levels of recovery um, are available to everybody um, and not just in, the, in, in all behavioral health. In fact, because I think it's there where we find, you know, some of the worst, um, you know, collateral assaults on our communities is in trauma, generational trauma and behavioral health. And all of that shows up in what we have, you know, for so many de uh, decades called addiction. I'm ending there on a bit of a soapbox, which is what happens when you invite a historian to come speak to a, a, uh, a non-historical audience. Uh, they're likely to take liberties and start giving out prescriptions about the future. But uh, that said, I look forward to the conversation afterwards. And thank you so much for the invitation. I wish I could be there in person, but I look forward to joining you all today virtually. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Roberts, for, for such a fabulous um, talk. And we, we appreciate your soapbox. That's why we like bringing in uh, um, historians to join us and, um, and, and share their perspective. That was, that was wonderful. Um, we definitely want to open things up. Uh, I see lots of, lots of hands waving on, uh, <laughs> here on the, on the Zoom, but certainly want to open things up for questions. If, if people have questions, you can, I think it's a relative, well, a little bit of a sizable group. So maybe if we could put it in the chat or if you want to um, indicate that you have a question by raising your hand or turning on your camera. Maybe that'll help me too to know who wants to ask a question. I, I could ask a question if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Please Hi, um, I'm Lydia Pecker. I'm a sickle cell doc at Hopkins. And so of course, hey. what you're saying about stigma totally resonates um, here. Um, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about, um, well, first, I wanted to thank you. That was fantastic. So apologize. Let's start there. That was a really great talk. Thank you. Um, and um, but I wanted to, to I wanted to wonder with you about what a language of a more creative language of pain control and and addressing pain, right? Not just physical pain, but there's all different kinds of pain. And one thing that I'm 
always struck by in the sickle cell world is that we lack a language to really address pain well in our community. And at Hopkins, we started using buprenorphine um, with our patients. And it's been really interesting to see how our team has been challenged to evolve a language um, that is uh, much more descriptive and, and much less clinical in some ways. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts about that are, because in the harm reduction movement, I was struck that there's a similar challenge that the language of clinical treatment doesn't serve the community that you're trying to reach well. Yeah, that's a, and thank you so much for your, your kind words, Dr. Pecker, and, um, and, and for the question. It's certainly a thought-provoking one. I'm going to say at the outset, um, I probably do not have an adequate answer. Um, and I should, yeah, I'm a historian and not even a historian of pain. Um, so I can't even give you a historical background. Um, however, I can say that um, what you were saying about the, the lack of language in um, clinical settings about this. And uh, I would say, yes, that you do see that um, in harm reduction critiques of medicalization the way I see harm reduction is that it's neither criminalization nor medicalization, which is to say that I think everybody in harm reduction, you know, is against criminalization, right? That's, I think that's, that, that I think is a safe assumption. Many within that movement, um, you know, are, I think, you know, understandably, and I think correctly, a bit worried about, you know, medicalizing this thing that we used to call addiction and we call substance use disorder, right? Um, it, one thing that we know about the history, and I'm not, I, I mean, I know there are many physicians in the audience, so this might be where it's a good thing that I'm speaking remotely so you all can't throw rotten fruit at me. <laughs> um, but I think we know that, you know, in the history of, you know, the AMA, for example, that's not an organization that has always acted in the interest of public health, right? Um, what we do know is that quite often there's a kind of, um, you know, disease capture that happens where, you know, we have a social condition and then by medicalizing it, you know, perhaps we we're attempting to lower the stigma on it, right? You know, particularly if we can destigmatize something and medicalize it, you know, that from the point of view of the, you know, in a pariah center or from the point of view of someone suffering the condition, that might be a good thing. But then quite often is the case that we've thrown that person at the mercy of the medical industrial complex. So a number of harm reductionists will say, yeah, you know, for many people, their problematic use is something that can be helped with medicine. You know, be it, you know, buprenorphine, be it methadone maintenance, you know, which are I think widely recognized as very powerful tools, not just in the substance use treatment arena, but also in, in harm reduction as well. Um, but there are differences between medicalizing substance use disorder and saying it might actually be a bit more complicated than that. I think there are a number of people who are very uneasy, you know, at the reformist language that says, you know, addiction isn't, and you all have heard this before, addiction isn't a crime, it's a medical disease. You know, this is the NIDA paradigm, right? And, and the NIDA paradigm for good reason has many critics. Um, and it kind of puts us, the rest of us in a kind of uneasy position of having to choose between these two binaries. And one of the powerful things I, I see in harm reduction, not just the harm reduction of color, but I think harm reduction generally, the more thoughtful and, and introspective and analytical members of that movement are very much trying to develop a third way of thinking about it. That's neither of those. Um, while not being anti-medicine, I don't think anybody in the movement is anti-medicine, but medicalization is not medicine. Medicalization is when you take something and make it solely the purview of the authority of, of doctors. Um, and that could be, you know, that could have its problems, particularly when we, when we know that 90%, more or less, of everybody who successfully dealt with a substance use problem did so on their own with no medical or social interventions at all, which is to say some, something cognitive might be going on there. Um, I've done, if not a good job, a rather elaborate one of dodging the question, Dr. Pecker, but I hope that those observations might elucidate something about our inability to speak about pain you know maybe you know fully medicalizing pain itself might be the problem um maybe there, are there other languages that we could bring to bear on this and i don't know i'm really just answering your question with another one so if i if i come up with the answer in the next year or so i'm gonna i'll angle dr cruz and dr cooper to invite me back and we can continue that and thank you so much for that oh 
I don't know who I... else is raising their hand, but go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your very insightful comments. It's really been very thought provoking for me. So the context I work in is as an infectious disease provider who is seeing patients presenting with infectious diseases, they are predisposed to due to substance use. And you know, a big part of my work is trying to get providers to think about harm reduction as understanding that seeing the person sitting in front of you within the larger picture of criminalization, racism, stigma, right, that feeds into why this individual is presenting to you so that when you are talking to the individual, you are not reaching for a prescription pad to write a prescription, thinking that that prescription will solve all the problems, but also thinking about other supports you can provide to that person to support their decision. Like the idea that we don't get to make the decision that you are ready to not use substances now, and I'm gonna make you do that. Like everybody still has the autonomy to make that decision about where they are, what their goals are, and as providers, our goals, our job is to support them in meeting their goals. So that I, this whole discussion about medications comes up very frequently, right? Because for me, my thought about substance use is that it's, might have been predisposed to by social circumstances that need to be addressed, but there is, we know some biology that has changed the way the brain works and the medications do work to try to correct the, the variations in the biology that's driving the craving. And I'd love to get your thoughts on how one to incorporate the biology of how these medications affect the brain disease, right? With this big picture of how substances affected the black community, right? So that we are using understanding of where this comes from, all the things you've spoken about, right? To inform our approach to addressing substance use in our communities. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm gonna repeat the question back to you to make sure that I that I've actually captured all of its complexity. Um, it sounds like you're asking me about the commonly raised observation that the use of certain substances will in fact alter, I think you said change the brain and how it works. Yeah. And typically that's evidenced, you know, most recently, you know, I'm a historian, so most recently means anything in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, the advent of fMRI, you know, applications to studying brain function. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I more or less catch, capturing that? Yeah, I mean, so we have that information, but I also see it in that when my patients are able to consistently stay on, stay on their medications, then they feel better and they do better. And which medications are we, are we speaking about? Substance, uh, yeah, uh, substance so use disorder? Yeah, buprenorphine yeah. for opioid use disorders. You know, now we're using injectable formulation. So it's, you know, easier for them to stay on medications. And I see that when they are on the medications, they feel better. But I understand that that doesn't take them out of the environment, right, that predisposed to this in the first instance. Mm. And so my question really is that how do we optimally use the medications, but use an understanding that this is not all biology. There are social factors, there's stigma, there's generational trauma that predisposed to this, how do we also address that as we try to make a difference, both as a doctor sitting with a patient and as a community that's interested in addressing health inequities? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that as well. Um, it's Dr. Falade and Wulia. Yes. Oh, wow. You're good. That, okay. <laughs> all right. Good to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, you know, my comments today are a kind of epilogue to the book. Um, actually, I'm not even sure that anything that I said today, actually, it may end up being an article. So I'm, I'm actually publishing this work, um, you know, imminently. It's coming out, I think, later this year or something. But um, it, this, this stuff may not be in the book. In the book, I actually address a bit about that with the early history of methadone maintenance, um, where you have, you know, the first black methadone doctor um, who comes out of like a community uplift tradition. You know, he works up here at Harlem Hospital. 
um, you know, had been doing ER work, you know, had seen the trauma, you know, when you work in the ER in Harlem in the 1960s, you only have to do that job for about an hour before you realize, oh yeah, heroin is really doing a number here. Like heroin seems to be every, like drugs in one way or the other. You know, if it's not about drug use, it's about, you know, people fighting over money. That's, you know, the, the whole thing. Like, you know, ERs are very special places. Um, you all probably know this more than, better than I do. Um, and so he's the first black methadone physician um, in the country and, um, and perhaps the world actually. And the, the pushback he gets from black communities um, is both, it's, it's the, it took me a while to really under, to kind of wrap my mind around it because it's both from a place that I think many of us, you know, who have sympathy with harm reduction, you know, who support harm reduction, you know, really didn't like, the, wouldn't have liked these critiques but at the same time, it's entirely understandable. So people would, you know, tell him the way people told Amani Woods, you know, you're an agent of genocide. You know, you're like, so our problem is narcotics and your cure is giving us more narcotics, right? Because that's, that's methadone is an opioid, right? It's very similar to heroin, except because it's synthetic, it takes a much longer time to metabolize. And therefore you can stabilize not just your, 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 your body, but your life, right? Um, that's the beauty of it. But if you don't really, if you're thinking about recovery as being just abstinence, it makes no logic at all. Um, and the common assertion was giving, and this is not my words, like I said, I don't use the word addict at all. I don't use the word addiction really, unless I'm talking about in a historical context, as a historical concept. Um, but you'll see the old adage, you know, giving methadone to an addict is like giving gin to a bourbon alcoholic. You know, like, what's the difference really is the rhetorical question. And I think for many of us, like the, the difference is, is huge, right? It's, it's expansive. But at the same time, as you point out, it, it's not enough. And in fact, this doctor to whom I'm referring, and there's a quote that he uses, which is going to, I think it's going to be the title of my book. Um, you know, he makes the argument that methadone actually is not enough. It's necessary for many people. But, you know, what's really required is he this is dr benny prim he died a few years ago but um for decades he called his work like one-stop shopping for recovery so you went to his place not just for your methadone but for um you know vocational assistance like yeah you know 10 15 years of living in the street i dropped out of high school like and now that i'm part of my recovery needs to be like i can't just be abstinent like i need to like get my ged or help me get housing you know counseling all those things um, and so even while he was the first black methadone physician, he himself from the, from day one knows like, this is not enough. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting, um, uh, story. And I think it elucidates the tension in our history, you know, for, you know, like methadone is about to be what, 50 years old in a few years, 1965. Well, methadone itself is from the late thirties, but methadone maintenance shows up in the mid sixties. Um, so no, it's going to be, it's about to be 60 years old. I'm sorry. Um, and I don't think we've ever gotten around that. So I think the tension that you're identifying in your practice today is something that we've always had. And I think I infer from your statements or from your question that there's a recognition in your, in your practice that more than buprenorphine is, is required. Is that, am I, am I hearing that correctly? Yes, yes you are. Yeah. And if you're asking me for advice on that, uh, this is where I re this is where I put, you know, the small print uh, at the top of my lecture. I'm a historian. I have no, no advice this, about running clinical practice. Like, no, so not about clinical practice. So your concluding statements was were included that we needed to use an understanding, right, of how the history, right, use that mm -hmm. to inform our next steps, right, our definitions of recovery, and just trying to get a sense of what some examples of how that understanding can be used to move us to a place where we're healing some of these, you know, hurts that have been going on for decades. Yeah, I would say, and I, I again, kind of, you know, eschewing an answer on this one, um, because I, you know, I, I was a big glib before about, you know, I'm a historian, so don't ask me about, you know, clinical practice, but I, I think in all seriousness, I, I think if I were to venture too much of a, 
of an opinion on that without the requisite training experience. It's a kind of professional malpractice as a historian. But I will say, um, as an observer of medical politics these days, there are ways in which medicine as it's being practiced, as it's being taught, as it's being um, even, um, I mean, maybe not, some of the research is still very biomedicalized. But I think what we see today, particularly in younger students and younger doctors, um, is a willingness to engage the social, you know, to, you know, to bring back Amani Woods, you know, messing with the social issues, messing with the political issues in ways that I'm not sure we necessarily would have seen in the heyday of, you know, biomedical individualism of the 1990s. The 1990s was the decade of the brain. And it's from there, it's, that's the kind of more or less the genesis of the NIDA paradigm. Like does, addiction is a brain disease, right? And then, you know, that's why we have the MRIs and, you know, like you give somebody drugs and watch all the pretty lights go off. And it's like, that proves that it's a brain, that, it doesn't really prove that, you know? Um, that's a, kind of our height of biomedical individualism. And I, I see today, I, I speak with medical schools you know, two medical schools and medical school faculty and medical, stu medical school students quite often. And I've seen, and I follow many of them on, you know, social media and their careers. And as a historian, I think we are embracing this, the social aspects these days in ways that I don't think were entirely imaginable 20 years ago or so. Um, and that, that engagement isn't just on the matter of kind of, you know, hitting retweet or whatever, but also where we see physicians who are, you know, forming chapters of, you know, Black Lives Matter or, you know, physicians who, you know, get involved in politics in one way. I don't mean formal necessarily electoral politics, but um, I think there's ways in which we are moving from that direction. I know this doesn't really answer your question either, but as I'm going to stay within my lane, um, you know, where I'm more comfortable practicing my trade and say as a, as a historical trajectory, I'm very interested and even hardened by these recent trends. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I'm you. sorry, Dr. Falati and Julia. That's, Thank you so much. Yeah. I feel like I'm batting like zero and two at this point oh, no, um, you're for answering questions. So. I don't but think thank you for that. You've given us a lot to uh, to think about. I think for sure, Dr. Cooper. I think you had a question. I saw your mic. Yeah, okay. Right. No, it's it's a pretty concrete question. Just about how much of this work is actually being applied to other, like to mental health conditions, things like depression, bipolar disorder. That often, be, particularly, I would say bipolar disorder, but also kind of the, you know, the other disorders where there's often like psychosis that leads to behavior that can be interpreted as antisocial, uh, definitely like mm. is antisocial at, at times. So I'm just wondering how much, how often you, you've seen or if whether you yourself or whether any of your colleagues have looked at this, um, this sort of paradigm related to the same one that you've used um, applied to people with uh, drug conditions. Um, yeah people with other mental disorders? That's a great question. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper, for, for attending and for inviting me. So thank you. I don't think you and I've ever met before, but I've been looking forward to it. I think we missed each other last time I was in Baltimore. We did, we did. Yeah. So I'm really glad we're meeting at least on the Zoom screen it's, for now. At least it's virtual. Yeah, that's better than nothing. So thank you again so much. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I really, um, you know, I'm trying to keep my, my analytical, you know, I, I mean, not necessarily objectivity, because I think that's kind of a, a screen. Like, I'm not sure there's anyone, any human beings completely capable of being quote unquote objective. But so I, I try to keep an analytical distance, right? So I don't want to make out this movement to be, you know, the cure for everything that ails us. But I do find something historically fascinating about it. It did emerge in that, you know, that historical moment that I, you know, identify about HIV, right? like the term harm reduction, I think the vintage is like 1986 or so. Um, and it's applied almost exclusively to needle exchange. Mm -hmm. And then maybe condom distribution, right? Um, and, you know, some other, you know, other kind of um, other strategies for essentially preventing a, the transmission of HIV, right? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was harm reduction circa, you know, 
you know, 35 years ago or so. And now um, it's so broad and so fertile that we're seeing it pop up in really interesting places. So yes, um, in, in mental health, particularly where we have, you know, kind of the hyper medicalization of mental health or the criminalization of, or not mental health of, of mental challenges, men behavioral health challenges mm -hmm. or the criminalization of right. those. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I was also thinking about the, you know, young people and, you know, um, you know, violence uh, reduction strategies too. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think the, um, you know, the anti-violence movement, um, you know, the black, you know, black and Latinx anti-violence movement in particular has a lot to say on this more than I do in that sense that, you know, they'll t any, anybody who's, um, you know, one of the interrupters or, you know, violence prevention workers in any, you know, in definitely Chicago here in Brooklyn, in, in Harlem, um, in the Bronx and, you know, Philadelphia, um, you know, they'll all tell you that anybody that they've ever dealt with, you know, in that context is dealing probably with some sort of trauma that's mm -hmm. intergenerational and contextual and social and all that. And that really what's needed is, um, you know, more of a behavioral health uh, approach. I find this particularly, I know the kind of defund the police um, as a hashtag, not as a movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the right, meaning really police, let's just be frank, really police mm -hmm. quickly just misinterpreted that deliberately, deliberately for the rest of us, right? Um, and made it about like, we just want to like fire all cops and whatever. Um, I think a lot of cops do need to be fired, not just the bad ones, like we just have too many of them. Um, and I think the movement itself, you know, when you, if you, anybody who bothers, and I think all of us probably here have, but not necessarily the right, um, anybody who bothers to look at that movement will understand that there's actually some really interesting proposals for taking some of those billions of dollars that any given municipality, like large, you know, municipality spends on policing and putting some of that into, you know, social work, right? Um, or, you know, behavioral health experts, you know, something like that. So I think that's, um, you know, certainly a promising um, in terms of our politics. I don't know where that goes. I mean, you know, Biden during the election, I believe afterwards or during the campaign and after the election, I think he just out of pocket, you know, point blank said defunding the police is a non-starter. Like, I don't think he ever read a single paragraph about what it meant. Um, it was it was it was unfortunate because um, he missed an opportunity to, to have a dialogue with people. Um, and it was a it was a bad move. But, you know, whatever. It is what it is. But um yeah, I certainly see in harm reduction a kind of, um, you know, like we're a, a thousand flowers blooming, kind of. And I think that's really in, you know, the colleagues with whom I, you know, interact, colleagues and friends in the movement, um, you know, who do this work. I kind of just, I study the work and, you know, I talk to people who do the work and I find them interesting. They don't understand why I like to follow them around all the place. Um, but I think what I see with them and kind of continuing Amani Woods' argument is that because of the fertility of the movement right now, we actually do need to have some sort of um, definitions in place. Like harm reduction at this point is becoming a little bit too broad for, I mean, the term itself. The movement should be broad, but we might need to have terms that have a bit more elasticity to them so that we know what we're talking about. Because now that money is following that term, um, and Dr. Cooper, you probably, you know this better than I do, you know, like probably, you know, like if you were writing grants 25 years ago and put in harm reduction, that's, that's pretty much a grant killer. Right. And whereas, <laughs> and whereas now the money falls like manna from heaven, for harm <laughs> reduction, and you're getting, you're getting some, you know, you're getting some, shall we say half baked proposals out there. Mm -hmm. A couple that I just saw like this morning, you know, where people are calling things harm reduction, where I think many of the people in the movement would say that is absolutely not harm reduction. Mm -hmm. Um, but without more robust and rigorous definitions, we kind of, we leave ourselves open to that vulnerability, the way movements often get co-opted mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank like you for your thoughts. Yeah. yeah uh, again, like thank you. A, um, a uh, like National Academy's kind of consensus panel or something to come up with a, a good definition. Um, it just made me think of that as you were, as you were saying that, but 
Um, are there, so I, there were some questions in the chat, but I wanna, if others wanted to ask questions verbally, I could wanna give you all an opportunity. I have not been keeping an eye on the chat, so I might. I have, yeah, I have them right here, but I just want to get oh, okay. people wanted to ask them out loud. I, okay, I'll go to I'll go to the um, I'll go to the chat here. Um, lots when you get a chance, uh, Dr. Roberts. Lots of just um, kind of uh, laudable statements here. <laughs> just with people who've enjoyed who enjoyed your talk. Um, one of the Thank things you. that came up. <laughs> One of the things was, that came up, um, this was from Bonnie Harris, um, who said, um, maybe you covered this, is there data on the harm reduction effectiveness? Also, there is a divide between 12-step recovery groups and harm reduction. How can they work together to reach those that want to recover? I was hoping you'd pick that question. Yeah, I saw that one. Thank <laughs> you so much, Bonnie Harris. I appreciate that question. That's an excellent one. Um, the, the, the answer to the first question is yes, absolutely. I think if you just kind of did, you know, PubMed, just kind of general search, um, the evidence for methadone as a preventive of HIV has been around since I think the mid eighties, like early on, maybe not the early eighties, but I want to say by like 89, the evidence was starting to come in. Um, and that is one of several arguments for actually um, expanding methadone access. Right now, it's a very heavily, heavily regulated drug, um, and largely because of fears of street diversion. And I think many people would argue that when you see methadone being diverted to the street, it's actually a sign of demand, not that you know kids are experimenting with methadone, um, but that people who can't enroll in a program are paying lots of money just because they don't want to use heroin in the street because they know it's not good. Um, so I would say it's harm reductive properties um, are well established and, sh and should be looked into. Same thing with needle exchange. In fact, it was the evidence that came out of New Haven um, circa 1987 or eight, maybe 89, that got New York City to launch its needle exchange program under Mayor David Dinkins in 1990. Um, and so there's been evidence, studies have been done internationally all over in the in this 30 years since. Um, in terms of 12-step and harm reduction, yeah, there have been some divides. Um, because 12-step traditionally, when I say traditionally, because one of the, the beauties of 12-step, you know, and it is beautiful if it works for you, you know, and any, you know, it works for some people, it doesn't work for others, you know, and that's not about the modality. It's about, you know, where you are at the time you engage it. But one of the things that people appreciate is that it's very decentralized. Um, a 12-step program you know, uptown, you know, in Harlem might be different from one on the Lower East Side or from, you know, from Brooklyn or whatever. Um, but traditionally, many of them have emphasized abstinence in ways that harm reductionists, with w w w ways in which, with which um, harm reductionists often are not comfortable. Um, I think there's ways, and I think rightfully so, that many people in that movement have been skeptical and a bit fearful of the reliance on an equation of recovery with abstinence. And so there's a kind of harm, uh, not a kind of, it is, it's a harm reduction oriented movement called non-abstinent um, non recovery. Um, you know, I think Amani Woods talked about a basic needs approach that, you know, where your recovery starts with just envisioning where you wanna be. And yeah, maybe where you wanna be some point is not using or maybe not using as much, or maybe you're using, but more safely. But right now, let's start with what you need today and we'll move forward there. And I think that's a powerful um, way of approaching it um, that often historically 12-step hasn't engaged. I say that with the caveat that that is less the case today than it was you know, yesterday, so to speak. Um, I'm thinking particularly of a great organization called Exponents, which is, um, I actually interviewed its founders. Um, I didn't do a product placement, but I, I, I run a pod, it's kind of Norbun now, we kind of put it on hiatus, but I, I run a podcast um, where I interview public health justice people, particularly people in harm reduction. Um, and uh, you'll find one of those interviews, um, I interviewed Joe Turner and um, Howie Josepher, who were the founders of Exponents, and they are the first harm reduction recovery agency where they have a program of recovery that's also one of harm reduction. And you'll see like at the harm reduction conferences, meaning the HRC 
and also um, perhaps to a lesser extent, the DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, at their biennial conferences, you'll see caucuses of harm reduction recovery people. So that divide that you identify certainly is still present and historically has been strong, but I don't wanna, I also wanna say that the, the very interesting and I think hope inspiring thing is that some of those divides are actually kind of melting a bit um, and not quite as salient um, as they might've been before. Did, did I answer that question? Okay, so at least I got one, <laughs> one out of four, Dr. Cruz. Did I get? I, I feel think, like I, I think you've answered all the questions. I think. All right, good. <laughs> given us lots That's of good. thought. Any uh, any others? I think we probably have time for maybe one final um, question. Did um, I think Galaxy A twenty one there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry about the Galaxy. I changed from my laptop to my <laughs> cell phone. So <laughs> apologies. But um, first of all, it's an excellent. Uh, topic, excellent talk, I've enjoyed it. Um, uh, I work in uh, uh, opiate use disorder and substance use disorder uh, and some of my um, team members are actually on this as well. Um, I like the idea of having this discussion uh, outside of just the clinical environment. We are part of the clinical environment, but I think when we talk about harm reduction, it's such a broad category in terms of what um, constitutes harm reduction and who are we talking to in terms of developing mm -hmm. that term mm -hmm. of harm reduction. Uh, it's easy to look at the clinicians because they're treating. Um, and then it's easy to look at the social works because we, you know, because there's also the clinical, there's the social work side, there's the behavioral side, there's the dual diagnosis. But I think when we talk about harm reduction, just exactly, um, who is the expert on knowing what, how you reduce this harm? Because I think in many institutions, and it's improving, but many institutions in developing the treatment also sometimes enhance the stigma because they still stand out as a separate population from those others uh, and, and individuals who are treated just for other quote unquote diseases. So um, and the treatment is great, but it, that's been needed. But at the same time, do we stigmatize again because it's uh, so separated? Even many of our primary practitioners who've been trained through our program um, uh, need help in even trying to initiate it into an already established practice. So at the same time, you know, well, do they do they sit with our patients, current patients? How do we separate, you know, when we're treating for the substance abuses? So I think. I, I think there's so many levels of harm reduction uh, that it's hard to identify, but I, I really appreciate a lot of the historical discussion and um, data that's currently out there. And I think it's still ever evolving. Well, thank you. And I've I taken that your name actually is not Galaxy A21. Can you tell me your name, please? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Settles Reeves. Good to meet you, Dr. Settles Reeds, and thank you so much well. for, for joining us. I, yeah, I could not agree more. And this is where I, it really hurts that I can't be with you in person because this would be the point where I would try to invite myself to you all's clinic so I can, you could give me a tour. I would, you know, ask Dr. Cruz if I could stay an extra day in Baltimore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, we're just but, down here in DC, so you're not far. Okay, well, I've got family in Virginia, so I'm gonna see them in a week. So maybe at some point I'll stop by and visit. But I, I, I if I re if I if I hear your statement correctly, um, I can't agree more. And I actually I need to thank you um, again for bringing it up because I don't know if I really highlighted it. Um, I think a HROC perspective is one that you know doesn't ask as, as you put it about you know harms, you know that people do to themselves quote unquote or that drugs do to people. That really the, what we need to be asking is what are the harms that we do to people? You know in our stigma. And I think we all, you know, particularly those of us here who, you know, work in this field. Um, I certainly, you know, work with people not as a clinician, but with people who are in recovery. I know, you know, quite a few of them. Um, and, you know, all of them, I think from my witness and I think from what they've all told me is that, you know, I think we all know that there are a lot of people who, you know, their quote unquote drug problems are years in their past, you know, 20 years. Yes. In, but that that conviction record isn't. You know, and that has done a lot to immobilize them in terms of, you know, getting a job, you know, getting furthering your education or getting your housing. 
Um, so I think a, a, a harm reduction that's relevant today has to talk about the harms that we do to people, not, mm -hmm. not the old way of thinking about let's help people not harm themselves mm -hmm. by using dirty syringes. So thank you so much for bringing that up because I don't think I really brought that up. I was kind of skimming through my notes and I, I think I missed that. And it's good, good to meet you, Dr. Suttles Reeves. Thank you. Uh, you as well. Thank you. Hope we can have this discussion later. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to talk to Dr. Cruz and get another invitation once the <laughs> pandemic lifts. Uh, you might see me sooner than you know. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so uh, everyone who, who's still remaining, please join me in thanking Dr. Roberts again for really this wonderful talk and the insightful uh, responses, including answers. Thank you. To the, to the <laughs> Thank you so um, much. I really enjoyed it, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming and being with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. You all have a good summer and be safe. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.